Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining our SPHN uh, webinar today. We are very happy about the numerous participation, especially because uh, today is kind of a home game. And of course, also because the topic of semantic interoperability is one of the important uh, core topics of SPHN. The SPHN interoperability framework endeavor started around uh, three years ago with Christian Lovis from Geneva as the chair of the semantic interoperability working group and the expert uh, in the field educating us from the SPHN uh, um, data coordination center, as well as representatives from hospitals and projects, uh, project collaborators on the critical importance of semantic interoperability on the use of internationally recognized standards or terminologies, classification ontologies. You will hear all the details about this in a few minutes. The vision back then was phrased as developing a semantically driven framework to enable the use of health related data for research purposes by introducing interoperability uh, not only within individual research projects, but also across projects and data providing institutions, and of course, in alignment with international efforts uh, and developments. We have come a long way since then and uh, actually released the latest version of the SPH and interoperability framework two weeks ago. You can find the link on our uh, website, sphn.ch. And I would like to take this opportunity now to thank again everyone involved, Christian Lovis, collaborators from the hospitals, from the projects, and of course, especially the DCC data interoperability team for their great work they have done over the last years. And with this, I would like to welcome our speakers of today, Sabine Oesterle. Sabine um, is the DCC interoperability, data interoperability team lead. She received her bachelor's and master's degree from the ETH in Zurich in interdisciplinary science and holds a PhD in synthetic biology. Christine Knotke, uh, Christine is the senior clinical data specialist in the interoperability team at the DCC. She received her diploma in medical documentation and information science from the University of Applied Sciences in Ulm in Germany. And Vasundra Touré, she is a bioinformatician by training and joined the DCC last October, moving here from Norway, where she did her PhD in bioinformatics at the Norwegian University, working on data standards and developing adequate bioinformatics infrastructures. So I'm very happy and also quite proud uh, to give the floor now to Sabine, Christine and Vasundra. Thanks a lot. We very much look forward to your presentation. Thanks a lot, Katrin, for this nice introduction. Um, and thanks a lot for everyone who joined today's webinar and for the great interest um, on our topic. So before we start diving into the interoperability of clinical data, um, let's first see about what are we talking about when we talk about clinical data or sometimes also in the SPHN context, you call it health-related data. The more or less we see three big um, types of data here. One is the hospital clinical data, which we also often refer to as routine data. So that's data which is collected when a patient goes to the hospitals in the kind of scope of the normal care procedures. So that's, for example, the diagnosis, this is lab tests, demographics, medications, but also, for example, um, against which kind of drugs you are allergic or also maybe as part of it, there will be a sample taken, which will be then analyzed. Um, talking about samples, normally what we do with samples is we, we generate molecular or omics data that can be genotic genomics, but also transcriptomics, proteomics, or metabolomics, or even things like flow cytometry data of, of certain cell types. And then we actually have a third um, type of data, which is the clinical research data. So that's some normally cohort or clinical study data. And this is really data which is collected in a, or in a, in a kind of study process. So this is not done as part of the clinical routine. And with an SPHN, of course, our aim is to make all of that data fair, meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. If we now look on this kind of data more from a data-centric um, perspective, there is actually quite a huge difference in them. So um, for the routine data, actually normally what we have is we have very large population sizes. We have a kind of real world situation because this is really the, really the normal routine which happens in the hospital. 
This data is collected on low cost because that's anyway collected. I would, however, would like to make here already the point that of course, standardizing and structuring that data comes with quite some costs. However, actually the idea is that this is done once and actually in a generic way, so it can be used for different users. And that means that we can actually share that cost of standardization and structuring between all the users. And it really becomes part of a general infrastructure rather than on a specific project. And then I think um, one other thing to take into account is that currently standardization is mostly done for billing and accounting. And that of course brings some certain characteristics of this um, standardization, which I think you need to be aware of when doing research with such um, coded data, for example, ICD-10 coded diagnosis. Um, within SPHN, actually, in the first phase, the hospitals really now took a lot of effort to actually bring all these data into so-called clinical data warehouses, meaning connecting all the primary systems within a hospital um, to this big clinical data warehouse and have here all the data available which are in the hospital for the use um, for, for research. If we go to our next um, data types, which was the molecular and omics data, most people say, yeah, but they are completely different. But what you need to think about is that normally molecular and omics data comes with also phenotypic and metadata information. So normally we have also here um, structured data available, which for example, um, for the phenotypic um, information often is, for example, the diagnosis or the demographics of the patients of the measurement. And here in the metadata, we have information on how was the sample collected, but also maybe how was the how was the analysis, for example, the genomics done? Was it a panel sequencing? Was it a whole genome? On which machine was it done? And of course, all these information also is very important for, for further analysis. When we go here to the clinical research data, the kind of characteristics which we have here is normally we have a quite limited population size because normally like a study has so many patients which it includes. It is normally a controlled environment because often you have really study protocols which really um, describe the kind of processes and describe also how the data is collected and also standardized. This comes with very high costs for this specific trial because they have such a controlled environment and often like study nurses really putting a lot of effort in high quality data. However, what it results to at the moment is really um, that each of such um, databases or data pools are silos in itself. So they are highly standardized within um, one study or within one cohort, but they are also not interoperable between each other. So when now someone like a researcher want to combine data from all of these sources, they need to somehow connect to all these different um, sources. And also they need to understand the data which is in there, decide which data to pick, how to do like bring it into one standard. And you can easily see if we would here add a few more researchers, um, this net would actually be um, quite um, crazy expanding because we have a lot of lines here of, um, different processes which need to be set up for actually using that data and understanding the data and knowing which data can be combined, which data mean the same. And that's actually why in SPHN we take the route of actually adding an in-between layer, which we call the semantic layer. And here it's actually not about harmonization. So we are not doing a data model and say, you need to and now fit your data in here and really um, need to fulfill certain criteria because this cannot be done because the data is already there and you cannot change the data to fit into some um, data model. What you can, however, do is to semantically describe the data so that actually the user, but also the machine, and I think this is very important, we want to have all of that machine readable because we are dealing with big data. And I can just tell you from one of our projects, if you suddenly have 6 million lab values, it's not like that you open that Excel screen, uh, Excel file on the screen and just look on it and say, oh, but I know that this is the same. So you really need to have that in an understandable way for the machine that you can write algorithms on top of it, which, which know it. And that's why we are actually semantically describing the data 
And due to the semantic descriptions, you know how certain things, even if they are maybe not exactly the same, but how they are connecting. And then it's really up to the researcher also to decide, can I now pull these two lab values, which were maybe measured differently for my context, or am I really want to study the difference between lab values which were measured automatically and by a test script, then of course you will not combine this data. Um, and this semantic description layer is then really at each um, researcher or each application can actually directly link to that semantic layer. So I think you can very nicely see if I would put more of our researchers here um, that would very easily scale because they all just need to understand the semantic layer, which is um, once defined. So maybe to um, visualize that a bit and to play it through with an example, what does this mean? Actually, I, I picked that example of the fever. So if you now think about how could be fever represented in different hospital system, maybe in a cohort, maybe in a clinical study, we could have the fever in different languages, because as you know, we have several um, languages in Switzerland. Maybe for a cohort, there's a question on it. Does the patient have fever? Maybe in another case, we have a text snippet which only says something similar. The, the patient had an erhöhte Temperatur. Or we have somehow like a measurement of a body temperature, which is 39 degrees, which also would say, okay, this patient also has fever. Again, if we now would somehow annotate the data that we try to say in our data model, okay, everything here is the same, then we again see that gets very complicated. And I think that's the reason why we actually use the semantic and the so-called controlled vocabulary. And controlled vocabulary, that's um, meaning you use an international well-recognized standard, for example, in that case, it's nomad CT, where we actually connect all of these terms to this nomad CT curve, because here, and then we actually also know that this one is the same than that, because it's connected over the fever term. If you're now very picky, you say, okay, Zavine, maybe you did now a bit of a stretch, because, okay, I can agree that fever is fever. That's only a, a translation thing. But body temperature 39, that's already an interpretation that this is fever. And I think that's why actually in such a semantic representation, actually also our connections can have a meaning. Meaning we would say here, fever is the same as fever. And for example, here for our body temperature, 39 degrees, we would say this has an interpretation, which is fever. However, in our final data model or in our final graph, these two terms are connected and we know the relation between, between them. If we now play that even further, we would have maybe somewhere in another clinical record, we would have a septic fever. And a septic fever, again, we can map that to a SNOMED CT term. And then actually in SNOMED CT, we know that the aseptic fever is a subclass of fever. So again, we, know we, now, we now know how the aseptic fever is connected to the fever because we are just expanding the graph. So now you would say, okay, but that just means we need to code everything in SNOMED CT. Um, and actually I would say no, because it doesn't matter um, which kind of standards you use. Because you can, for example, also take this long code for fever and say, this is the same as the SNOMED code. And again, going through the graph, you know, fever is also the same as here because we have two same as connections. Um, so I hope this really visualized you a bit on, the exam on an example, how we would build up such a kind of system and how we would um, play that through. And I think, Using such controlled vocabulary and such an approach is really the key of actually being able to link data sets within a project. So in our SPHN projects, for example, um, the different hospitals are creating um, data sets and then actually the data analysts at the other side needs to be able to combine these data and needs to understand um, how to connect them. However, it also allows us to connect between projects. Um, and that's of course only possible if there is the ethical and legal approval, but in theory for the further reuse, this is also possible. 
So we are not the only ones doing that. So um, this whole um, thing is um, called what, what's called the semantic web technology stack. So that's actually, it's a whole technology stack on, on different tools and standards to use to build up such um, graph schemas and to be able to query them, to actually also be able to do quality control of it. And here, what you can see here on the right, this is the um, open link data cloud. So that's data set which are actually publicly available and actually how they are um, interconnected. And I think what you can see here very nicely, the very dense blob here at the bottom, that's actually the life science and medical data. Um, so you can see that actually the connectivity here is, is very high because of standards like SNOMED CT, LOINC, ICD-10, and um, a lot of others. Also here, actually, I picked some additional examples from resources and data, which is actually available in such a, in such a structure and which um, um, can be actually easily interlinked. So we have, for example, the Gene Ontology Consortium. We have the MESH terms or the ULMS terms from the NIH, which I think most of you know. But then there's also, um, there is the data.gov, which is from the Center of Disease Control in the US, which has all their yeah, data sets in, a, in an RDF graph um, structure. And also there's some um, European product like the EHR for um, clinical, um, the electronic health record um, project, um, which is also available in such a, um, in such a structure. And again, this opens up the, um, the potential to be um, interlinking um, this kind of data or this kind of standards with your data um, for a new project. So everything is you see now is based on a, on a graph structure and um, based on so-called RDF. And Basundra will tell you later more about um, what RDF is and how it is. I think for now we can say it's a graph. So why are we choosing actually a graph to represent our data compared to like a, a data model like OMOB or FIRE or so? So I think here it's really the graphs can be easily merged and can also be easily extended. So I think you have just seen it in my example. I was just adding a new node with new connections. Um, so actually a graph can really grow very easily depending on, on your needs. And again, as soon as you, there are some tricks about it, which also Vazumbra um, will tell you later. So as soon as you follow certain rules, you just throw two, two graphs together and actually the connection find themselves um, by following certain standards. Um, also another important point I mentioned in my example is that connections can have meaning. So that's really the has interpretation is a subset of has a causing agency. So it's, it's really, it's not connecting because it's the same, but it's really um, connecting um, also um, with a meaning. Another um, very important thing is the so-called reasoning. So that's the inferring of knowledge from other ontology or data. And I think also I showed you that a bit in my examples so of example that we, with the epileptic fever, we know that this is a subset of fever. So if we search for all patients which have fever, we will also find that patient with the aseptic fever. If we, for example, um, have certain um, allergies, if we have one patient whose allergy is against peanuts and we have somehow like a search which search against everything which is pulse, vex, pulse vegetables for the German speakers, that's Hülsenfrüchte, um, you will of course also find um, the peanuts because due to snow CT, we know that the peanut is a, is a pulse vegetable. Um, actually, when you have this very high interlinked data, the performance of queries is much faster on such a graph structure than it is on a relational database. And also what is very, uh, very growing interest topic now is the so-called graph AI. So actually these graphs can be very um, interesting for machine learning because from a graph, you can get very interesting characteristics um, for your machine learning algorithms. For example, um, how well is a knot connected in the graph? How, what's the distance between two knots in the graph? And, and much more so. Um, if you are interested, I can share you later a lot of blogs also from Stanford and others on really how these graphs are now, now used in the world of AI technology. So for this reason, actually, um, what we wanted to do in SPHN is we wanted to improve data understandability and quality through structuring and standardization. 
And we wanted to get data out of the silos by linking the data. And that, of course, comes to the FAIR criteria, which I hope all of you know. And I here depicted some of the FAIR criteria, which I think we are addressing with that strategy. And I will come back to it at the end of the presentation, where we then introduced you to how we address all of them. So the FAIR criteria one, which is we need a unique identifier for each single data point. The findability criteria two, which means we need to describe each data point with rich metadata. The accessibility criteria one, which says we need a universal query language to actually query our data. The interoperability criteria one, which is we need a language for knowledge representation, which again is internationally um, recognized and um, understandable um, from, from this, um, you know, the standards which this language builds up. The E2, I hope you, I already convinced you on that one. This is the use of controlled vocabulary, so internationally known vocabulary to annotate your data. And the E3, the interoperability criteria free from the FAIR criteria, which is you need to be able to link your data to other resources in, in a very easy way. And this is why SPHN came up with the following strategy addressing um, these kind of FAIR criteria, as I showed you um, before. So it's actually a three pillar strategy. In the first pillar, we are actually describing certain so called building blocks. Um, so-called concepts. Um, so this is all the information you need to have to understand a certain um, set of information. And then actually this, um, these concepts are then actually built into a graph. And this graph is then actually be able um, to be used for different use cases. So actually in, in our setting, actually, um, projects are receiving the data in this common representation, and then they are actually building their adapters to their specific use case. So that can be the research project, but that could be also data catalogs and queries or other shared platforms. But the idea here is really to have this um, semantic layer, which is the same from for everyone, and then you can actually build the adapters for your specific um, interests. And I think with that, I would like to hand over to Christine, who will tell you more about this first pillar and how we build um, these kind of um, building blocks. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. Um, from the strategy, you can see that the semantic standards and the identifier systems play a very important role. So here you can see uh, several standards, as Sabine mentioned already, we are not focusing on one single semantic standard, but uh, when we say that we are ontology agnostic, we mean that we take into account several standards. For example, standards that are in place already in Switzerland, such as CHOP, which is a classification system for procedures like um, radiotherapy procedures or diagnostic procedures, and ICD-10, the German modification, which is used in Switzerland for coding of diagnosis. And all the um, systems in red depicted here are systems that are used worldwide. For example, MEDRA, which is a classification system used for pharmacovigilance and the coding of adverse events, or ATC, which is a system, also a classification, which is used um, for identifying substances used as active ingredients in medications. Now, I would like to focus a little bit more on two systems which play an important role in the SPHN strategy, and this is SNOMED CT, a quite broad um, ontology like uh, system which um, is used for clinical terms in general. So, very broad range for the biomedical domain, and LOINC, which is a coding system which provides identifiers for laboratory tests, for example. So first about SNOMED-CT, it's, um, as I said, um, 
a system used worldwide in more and more countries, and it's hosted by the organization SNOMED International. And in Switzerland, we are holding a license for that system, a license that's for the whole country since 2016. And eHealth Swiss is the so-called National Release Center, the, the yeah, organization in Switzerland that is the contact point for SNOMED CT. And the system, as mentioned, is very broad and covers the complete electronic health record. It is used, as I mentioned, since 2016, we have the possibility to use that for free in Switzerland. Uh, it is adopted already in the electronic patient dossier that is just released this year. And here, for example, to identify um, information about medications and um, the SNOMED CT codes. Now, what is interesting um, for research in that system? And that's something which is, for example, a difference to, class to classifications as uh, ICD-10, which are monohierarchies. Um, SNOMED CT is a polyhierarchy. That means one concept can have more than one parent. For example, as you can see here on the screen, viral pneumonia is a pneumonia, but it is also a viral disease. And that offers for research a nice feature. It means that we can aggregate data according to different characteristics. For example, if you want to connect or if you have data connected to SNOMED CT as we envision that with the strategy, you can ask for all patients with a disorder um, in the respiratory system and you get, so the disorder of the respiratory system is here in the polyhierarchy and you would get all the patients with bacterial respiratory infections, for example, and all the pneumonias. But if you're interested in all the patients only with bacterial infectious diseases, so you have a different point of view or different research interest, you would also get the patients with all the bacterial respiratory infections. Another feature of SNOMED CT, which is also enabling interesting possibilities in uh, data science, is the way how the concepts are built in SNOMED CT or defined. So, first, we have those ISA relationships. For example, a um, viral pneumonia is an infective pneumonia. These are these lilac boxes here on the screen. But in addition, SNOMED CT defines its concepts via so-called attribute relationships. And that's already a graph-like structure. And you can say here, for example, viral pneumonia has a pathological process, which is an infectious process. This is interesting from a research perspective because with that, SNOMED CT is not only um, yeah, a coding system, it's also kind of knowledge base. It offers more and it enables to uncover information that is hidden in the data that has not been explicitly documented. For example, if you want to ask for all patients with a problem in the lung, that's usually not uh, recorded in the clinical information system. It would be recorded that it's a pneumonia, it was a pneumonia or an infectious disease. But as a researcher, you would be able to ask that question when you place your query across the data and across SNOMED CT. As you can see here in that picture, we have as a third attribute relationship, the relation has finding site lung structure. And with that feature in SNOMED CT, we are able to ask for the lung problems, but uh, we also get all the patients documented with the viral pneumonia, and those would be included in our search result. So far about SNOMED CT, 
Um, now, uh, some words about LOINC, which is a coding system hosted by the Regenstrief Institute in the US. It is also possible to use that um, completely free. There are no costs related to it. And LOINC provides IDs for clinical observations, like heart rate, for example. But it's mostly known about um, or for their IDs for laboratory tests, to identify laboratory tests. And um, I made an example here for the LOINC code 2340-8. And in that code, there are six different pieces of information represented. So a LOINC code represents here as a component, for example, glucose, which is the analyte. The property is if that's um, um, a test measured in mass concentrations, or MCNC here stands for mass concentration, could be also molar concentration. We have the time, the temporal information related to it here, PT stands for point in time. The system that has been measured here, it's blood, BLD means blood. The scale, here it's a quantitative measurement, it can well be also a qualitative measurement, for example, positive or negative. And the method here in this example, it's a test strip automated method. With this flexible setting in LOINC that you have um, six different axes represented, it enables the, the projects to um, customize their queries, really tailored to their project needs. For example, you can have in your project the need really to be very specific and say, I need for the patients really the glucose measurement, as I just explained now, down to the method that has been used. Or you can be more vague or have a, a broader definition and ask for all the patients with a glucose measurement in blood, for example. Now, I said something about those um, semantic standards. How exactly do we use it? Do we specify how we use those standards so that we can use those features um, they offer us? So I would like to explain that along a use case example uh, of our SPHN data set. And we imagine that we have a research project X that defines a variable, for example, resting heartbeat that's measured in beats per minute. So this variable expression, or even if you think about the data, resting heart rate of 80 beats per minute for a specific patient is an expression with a lot of information inside. And what we do for building the data set is first that we do a decomposition of that information, that we put each piece of information once. So we have a concept heart rate here. And for that, we have the information of the rate, for example, 80. The unit, for example, beats per minute, the physiologic state, which is here in that example, resting. And in addition, we have further metadata, which is now apparently not interesting for the project we are looking at, but it could be for other projects, which is the regularity of the heart rate. It can be irregular or regular. The measurement method, here it's vascular oscillometry, and the temporal information. So here, the daytime when this heartbeat, uh, heart rate has been measured. Now, how exactly comes the semantic standard into place? What we do in the data set is we do a so-called meaning binding to SNOMED CT and wherever possible also to LOINC. That means for each of the concepts we define in the data set, we find the appropriate SNOMED CT concept and the appropriate LOINC code and connect it to it. We do the same for all the pieces of information that belong that describe the heart rate. For example, for the unit, which is a separate concept in the data set, we define that this should be according to the UCUM standard, which defines how a unit is really 
written in a way that it's interoperable between all the providers and users. For the physiological state, we define a subset of SNOMED CT terms that can be used to represent the value of that physiological state. We had in our example resting, and resting is actually a child of the SNOMED CT code finding related physiologic patient state. And when we say here child of, we mean that all the children or yeah, concepts below this SNOMED CT code are can be used to represent a physiologic state for, for a patient. And for the regularity, we are very specific. We do a complete value set binding and say not only regular, but we use the SNOMED CT concept of pulse regular to express a regular pulse and uh, pulse irregular and unknown or other uh, possible values. Now here you see a lot of uh, SNOMED CT and um, LOINC uh, on the screen, but we can also use the other uh, semantic standards like ATC or CHOP to do such meaning binding and value set binding. We are not uh, limiting that to, to any specific uh, semantic standards. So this is just an example of one concept in the SPHN dataset, and you can find the full list in an Excel file, which is published um, on the SPHN website. Um, and in there, all the concepts are described with their data, metadata that are needed to understand this concept. In total, at the moment, we have 58 such compositional concepts described in the data set. And those are concepts of general importance for research, such as birth date, gender, diagnosis. Concepts that are relevant for more than one use case in SPHN, such as allergy, or concepts of high importance for personalized health projects specific uh, concepts from the oncology domain and concepts, for example, from the intensive care domain. And with that, I would like to hand over to um, Vasundra. I was now talking a lot about the specification. So this is all in an Excel file. And uh, she will now explain and show you how that specification comes to life is implemented in RDF. Thank you, Christine. So, okay. Um, now we have seen with Sabine the scope of the project and Christine just presented to you how we define the concepts with the, within the SPHN project and how, um, I mean, which terminal external terminologies we're using for uh, representing our data. And the part of um, now this part will be more focusing on how we are actually connecting all the different concepts together um, to be able to uh, represent our uh, data and build knowledge. So we're taking again the example of the heart rate, which has um, several metadata connected to it to represent it or attributes. But one may also be interested in knowing which patient actually got his heart rate measured, uh, at which hospital the patient received the care, how old the patient is, what diagnosis was given, or even which drugs have been prescribed. And in order to connect all this information and to provide it to the user, we generate the SPHN RDF schema. So this is based on the RDF technology. And with that, we are able to bring together the knowledge and connect it together. And this also goes by the name of linked data and that is quite of a um, well-known um, strategy for connecting data uh, in science. So just a few words about RDF. So it stands for Resource Description Framework. It's a standard that has been developed by the World Wide Web Consortium um, and it is part of the semantic web technologies. So meaning that we are trying to build knowledge from text that is also understandable um, by computers. 
And this is done through the description and modeling of information in a graph structure, as you already have seen it before. And um, this graph structure basically enables us to share the knowledge with others, but also has an, an easier or facilitates the data you reuse and uh, exploration. So in a short summary, RDF is quite flexible, it is simple, and it is also a structured way to represent data. And in addition, um, in order to fulfill one of our FAIR criteria, um, we have this international querying language that is called SparkQL that can be used for any um, knowledge represented, represented in RDF. So in the context of SPHN, we are using RDF for the transport and storage of health-related data. We also use it for having a common data representation so that the different hospitals know how to represent the data. And this common data representation enables actually an easier integration of data between different resources. And we also use the flexibility that is provided by RDF to, be, um, to connect it um, to connect our data with external resources, as we will see in a few slides. So knowledge in RDF is basically built with the atomic um, structure that is called triple, a triple. And a triple is basically composed of a subject, a predicate, and an object. So the subject is basically the element that we are providing information about in that triple. The predicate is the type of information that we are looking at, and the object is the value. So in summary, this triple is a binary interaction that is connecting two elements where we learn something about the subject, and the object is the actual value. And in the SPHN project, we have been using those technologies to be able to connect our data. So what are the process that we have done? We started first by building an RDF schema. So the schema is what will tell us how we should represent the data. And this is basically a template that the data provider will follow to annotate or provide their data. So you have here the example of the subject Soto identifier that is an element that we define in um, the RDF schema that tells us that this inf uh, in this information, you should provide um, the patient. And this subject pseudo identifier also has a connection to a heart rate. So we know that a subject pseudo identifier can have a heart rate. And this is represented by this triple here. But then in addition, the heart rate can also have information annotated to it. So we have, for example, the unit. A heart rate has a unit. And this is represented by this um, building block here. If you remember also Christine's talk, um, she mentioned um, connectivity to external resources, and we do meaning binding of our concepts uh, with SNOMED CT and LOINC. So here you see how we are able to do that also in REF. So we have our heart rate that is stated to be the same as this SNOMED code. So meaning that they have the same meaning. And once we have our RDF schema that is built, the data providers will take the schema to be able to generate the data and represent the real world information. So how do they do that? They need to instantiate their data. This means that here, for example, you have patient one that is defined and the patient one is basically a type of subject pseudo identifier. We also have a heart one, which is a specific heart rate, which is of type heart rate. And then we also have a unit. So for the heart rate, we know that units are usually bits per minute. And in this context, you can see that we are also linking to an external resource instead of reusing um, or maybe making our own um, um, instance data for uh, the unit, for representing the unit. So now that we have the instance data, what we need to do is to connect them together. And for that, we simply take back the properties that were defined um, in the schema and connect the patient to the heart rate that was measured uh, for that patient. The heart rate is connected to the unit, which is the bits per minute. And this is how we build the knowledge. But if you remember also our example in, a few, um, in our previous slides, 
the heart rate also had other types of information annotated to it. So it's not only the unit, you also have a value. In this case, the value is 80. You also have a date time when the heart rate was measured. So um, that you have annotated with the property has date time. We also have a physiologic state. So in this case, you can again observe that we are connecting to an external resource. In this case, a SNOMED code that states that the physiologic state of this heart rate measurement was at the resting state. And finally, we have a regularity um, information stating that the pulse was regular. So you can see now how information is connected. And of course, you don't only have the heart rate. You also get information uh, for a patient about the diagnosis that he uh, obtained or the uh, some me other measurements as well. And all of these are interlinked in this graph um, structure. And with that patient, you also can instantiate many other patients and all of them will be connected in this um, RDF graph. And at some point you may notice or the graph will be able to connect different uh, elements together. So maybe there were two patients that had, um, for example, a heart rate of value 80 and they had a, the same diagnosis that was given. So using the RDF technologies, but also the querying language that we have with Scarquel, we're able to extract those type of information or pieces of information that we may be interested in, but um, the connectivity will be shown through the RDF. This is not something that we can see, for example, um, in. Um, CSV or Excel data where all the information are split and we need to do you know, those joints and between tables to be able to find um, connection between um, information. So this is the beauty of the graph that everything is connected and then you can simply query for patterns that you're interested in. And maybe sometimes you even see um, information that you were not able to observe uh, from the human high. So, with the RDF schema, we have now a template how, um, that tells us how the data should be encoded. And we hope that with that, we are reaching certain data fairness. Um, the content is of course, based on the data set that was presented by um, Christine. Um, so which contains the whole semantics and we're following that data set to represent um, the schema. It is generated by the DCC together with the RDF task force, um, which contains um, people or member from the host university hospitals and the different projects. Um, and on the right side, you can see a few number from uh, the new release that we had um, two weeks ago. And you may note that we have a couple more um, classes or concepts uh, than we had in the data set. This is because we have defined additional things to be able to represent value sets in the RDF properly or including the external terminologies. And this is why those numbers are a bit um, popped up. So last thing um, is that uh, projects are also allowed and they are actually advised to extend the RDF to, be, um, to fit it for their purposes, so for their project goal. So we have the SPHN data set, we transform it into an RDF schema but then it is also possible to extend the existing concepts or add even new concept based on the needs of a project. And with this flexibility, there is one thing to keep in mind is that within the SPHN part, we will be 100% interoperable or we should be 100% interoperable, but with the extensions and the concepts, so on, the, on those deltas, we will not be able to ensure interoperability between different projects. So within a project, we should have interoperability on those part, but between projects, this is something that we may um, not be able to reach. So just for you uh, to keep in mind um, this information. And now I would like to give back the word to Sabina to present the current status and the plans that we have for um, the RDF. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Vasundra, for for this um, deep dive into to RDF and also Christine for the deep dive into the data set. Um, I would like now to give you a bit of a more um, administrative idea of where do we stand with all of that, what is planned next. 
So the current status of all of that is that um, we had a pilot um, phase which was done by the university hospitals and actually we after a successful pilot we brought actually um, a request to the NSB in September 2020 which actually um, approved RDF as an exchange format and also LOINC um, as a standard for lab tests or SPHN. Um, and since then, we, as we said, we worked very hard to actually do the new release of the SPHN schema, which was um, published two weeks ago. So this has, um, as we said, a new concept in it, but also as a very important feature, we have now the meaning binding or the controlled vocabulary um, using SNOMED CT and LOINC. And also, um, Vasundra worked a lot on the actually the better linkage of also the external terminologies and the value sets um, for um, for the actual data. So we have the meaning binding, but we have also um, the connections when we want to um, represent data as, for example, the resting state in um, SNOMED CT. Um, for a seamless integration of our external terminologies together with the RDF. Um, um, data which you will receive from the hospitals, we also worked on actually providing all these um, standards in RDF in a compatible way with our SPHN schema. Um, so um, they are, these ones are now all available in RDF compatible with the, um, with the data set. Also on the tooling side, I think we worked a lot because as you can imagine there are certain tools um, needed to work with ontologies and RDF. So in the first step, you, um, as Vazundra said, projects need to um, create their own ontology, extend their own ontologies. So here we have um, more or less like two recommended um, software stacks. Um, the one is Protege, which is a product of Stanford with to um, handle ontology. It's a desktop version. And then also the DCC is hosting an, an web version of it, which is the DCC Web Protege, which actually enables you to share ontologies with your project partners and comment on certain things and to develop that in a, in a um, collaborative way. Then when you receive data um, in RDF, um, you need to build up an RDF, a graph database, and you need to be able to um, query that data. So with the Sparkle um, language, which was under told you, so here actually we um, did an evaluation of different projects and we choose GraphDB as the software of choice. And for our SPHN projects, we are actually providing GraphDB licenses um, on Biomed IT. So I think that is really a very nice tool to, to work with the RDF data. Also, we um, provide documentation on how was the data set and the RDF schema built, but also how is it used, how how, um, how, for example, what's the rules when you extend it? Because I think um, what Vasunda nicely said is you might not get interoperability when you extend the schema. However, as better you, are, you adhere to certain rules in extending it, as more you will reach interoperable, interoperability also for your extensions. And I think that's what we try to outline in this user guide. Also, there's a few must-haves which you need to fulfill that you will not clash um, when you do the extensions. Also, um, we did a first um, training session on RDF and SparkQL, um, I think also like three weeks ago. This is also available on our SPHN YouTube channel, but also um, on the website um, if you want to follow that training. And um, it was a very nice start. So what's now planned? I don't have control of my insights, no, I have. So the next steps, as we said, we released a new um, SPHN RDF schema two weeks ago. So the next steps would be now to deploy that new version in the hospital. So actually the hospitals all develop pipelines on how to export um, the RDF and they need to be now updated because also there's now more data represented in the schema. So this data also needs to be mapped from their local system into that schema to also make these things available. Um, of course, we are not done yet. So we will further continue on new concept definitions. So for example, we will 
um, cover the areas of cardiology, microbiology, but also genetic information to be included into the schema so that also this information can be stimulously used. And we really here count on the help of our driver projects um, to help us with these kind of definitions. As I said before, we have all these um, external resources available in RDF. At the moment, they are only files which can be given by us to people on request. What we would like, however, to build is a so-called terminology service. So that's like a, a service which will host all of these ontologies and will be available in the Biomed IT nodes for an, an easy use of the, of the researchers um, to be able to really seamlessly use these um, external resources. Also, one very important um, point is the data validation and quality control. As with RDF, we are setting on a standard which is very flexible. Also, an ontology is only like a, a blueprint, but if people stick to it, that's up to them. And that's actually why um, with so-called chuckle rules, which is, an, again, another VC free standard, you can actually really um, make constraints and how to validate data which was generated in RDF to fulfill certain um, standards or certain requirements. And this is really um, what we are now heavily working on to actually actually really ensure that the RDF data we are producing has um, a certain set of um, quality standards. Also, um, we start um, with together with Biomed IT now to set up research support. So really helping project and how can they modify their ontology, but also how can they explore their data with um, SparkQL. And I think that goes hand in hand with also the kind of training sessions we are planning. So um, we are planning more trainings on ontologies, um, the SPHN standards. So Christine gave you a very short introduction on LOINC and SNOMED, but there is more to learn about these standards and how they can be best used for research. So with that, I would like to summarize, and I hope I could convince you that with that strategy, we, we are able to actually get data out of silos and be able to link the data and therefore fulfill the FAIR criteria. So as promised in the beginning, I would like to come back to our FAIR criteria. So the first one, which was the F1, the unique identifier, um, Vasundra mentioned it, we have for every Point in RDF, we have the so-called URI, which is a unique research identifier. So that criteria is fulfilled. We have the rich metadata. I hope Christine convinced you that with our definition of the concepts, we are actually providing the possibility to express a lot of additional data to a single um, data point. For example, for the heart rate, we have all the additional um, attributes to, to describe um, this heart rate. We have the universal query language, which is the SparkQL. Um, we have not talked a lot about it, but if you're interested to learn more, you can contact us. I think the language for knowledge representation, that's the RDF itself. I think that's very easy. The controlled vocabulary, as we said, we use LOINC and SNOMED mostly at the moment. However, our strategy is flexible to use whatever standard um, which, is, which you want. And also, I think, which is very important, we allow for several standards. So we don't need to choose between LOIC and SNOMED. We just annotate it the same as for both. And if there is a third standard which can be used, then we can also add a third standard. And I think that's really important that we don't need to do these choices because making that choices is impossible. You will never make it right for everyone. Um, and the last criteria was the linked data. I think this is really the core of RDF and the URIs and the controlled vocabularies, how to um, link these kind of things. Um, what you have also seen, I think, building such an infrastructure is a large collaborative and iterative effort. So we really need the help of each domain experts in how do you best represent um, the concept. And this really needs the insights from domain experts what is actually exactly needed for, for describing a cardiology concept or just describe an oncology concept. So this is really um, a, a large um, endeavor and we are very happy that actually the whole SPHN community helped us here a lot and also will help us in the future um, to do these kind of things. And with that, I would like to come to the acknowledgements. Um, as also Katrin already said in the beginning, 
this is a huge endeavor of a lot of people also, as I said, over the last three years. So actually the names, putting all the names on the slides would have crashed that slides. Uh, the slide. That's why I would say like to say thank you to the SPHN RDF task force and to the former clinical semantic interoperability working group who actually um, developed a lot of that. However, there was also a lot of other people from our Swiss University hospitals involved in this endeavor. So I think really thank you to everyone. Also, we had great support from people in um, SIB who have a lot of experience on the RDF ontology, which really helped us getting that off the ground in the beginning and also still now are really valuable um, partners for discussing um, certain um, issues. And also I would like to thank um, Trivadis. So Trivadis is a consultant company which helps us on actually building this whole framework. And I think with that, um, we are done and I'm looking forward um, to the questions. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Vasundra, for this comprehensive overview. We have a lot of questions, so I will move right into it. Um, there is a question probably going to Sabine. When you say you combine data, do you mean pooling, assuming that the different data sources cover different persons? Or is it a, a linkage uh, in terms of combining uh, information on the same person? Um, as I think what we are not doing is this is not a measurement to help you to, to find out that actually Hans Müller, who we now have an identifier for, which was in hospital A, is the same than patient 10 in, in, in another hospital. So that's really out of scope. What we want to um, achieve is really that we get additional knowledge. And I think um, Christine put it very nicely that, for example, when we have data annotated with a certain SNOMED code, that we can actually use, for example, the SNOMED CT connections to explore more data. Also, this helps if you have two data sets and one data set has a certain relation mentioned between two terms, then of course that also can be transferred to the other data set or to the other um, patient. Thank you, Sabine. Um... Another question, it is not always easy to interpret clinical concepts. Sometimes clinical concepts are not well defined, but we have no consensus for it, have recommendations to make on how to link these fuzzy concepts to ontologies. Also, where can we find the precise meaning of ontologies? I think this was a very early question. Maybe you answered most of it already now, but would you like to quickly summarize the answer to this? Yeah, I think you are completely right. And I think that's really the kind of, of efforts we need to now do in the hospital that we really can find out the meaning of what a certain data point means. So quite often it's like, oh yes, we don't, it's not in the data, but everyone knows because in this hospital, it's always done like that. And it's always done according to that SP, uh, SOP, which is in that kind of drawer. And I think our goal is really now to bring all of that into the graph. So all of that into the data, because actually when you share the data with external researchers, they maybe don't have access to your SOPs and to your common knowledge, which you may have in the hospital. And also, again, if we think in the direction of big data, this needs to be all accessible for the machine because we really need to now move into the direction of data-driven research. So the machine needs to have that knowledge as well. It doesn't help if a person knows, oh yes, I, I know I cannot compare apples with peers. The machine needs to understand um, that as well. So I think that's really also a cultural shift which needs to go on in the, in the way we, we recruit um, data. So there's, yeah, that's an additional thing we, we try to do, but of course um, this is, um, cannot be fixed centrally. That's really a cultural shift within the hospitals. Okay, then there comes the question that we all expected, right? Did I understand correctly that you said uh, that this graph-based RDF style approach is more flexible than, for example, the Odyssey OMOP? Uh, and if it's if that's correct, what or why uh, did Switzerland design decide not to align with the internationally increasingly adopted OMOP uh, model but develop its own more flexible approach? Yeah, I think. Um... 
as we said before, I think OMOP is um, also what we have seen in the last year is actually moving quite in similar um, directions also with the use of, of the external ontologies and so on. This is very similar. However, still we have seen that on my first slide, we are really planning to be able to link all data. So what I have not yet covered is, for example, also citizen data. So really like the data from your Fitbit and, and these kind of things. And I think here we, we really see the benefit in using the RDF graph um, to be able to very quickly extend that. Well, actually, as we said, um, for, for other communities, they um, also, if we need to stick to an international community, we always need to wait until the community is ready for these things. So that's um, sometimes quite, um, quite slow. That's why actually this um, RDF approach was chosen. I think we are not alone with that. We are in very close contact with, for example, the people from the Netherlands, from Mastro, but also from people from the US, which um, actually take a, a similar approach. And again, I would say, the overall idea behind all these approaches is not too different. So the, the core idea is the same. And I think that's also why, um, for example, I can tell you one example from our colleagues from the Netherlands, which they have databases in OMOP, like hospitals, which have an OMOP adopted as a data model. And they now still translate this OMOP databases into RDF to be able to more flexible interlink it. So that's really the kind of um, things we see. I think we are more taking the approach. We try to have that more flexible middle layer, but for example, we could easily build and adapt it towards the OMOP, the OMOP model, which would be in our case, the third pillar. So um, if, and this is again, this needs to be done once because you only need to do once the mapping and adapt it towards the other standard. Thank you, Sabine. So there is one question regarding uh, um, the anonymization of data. I think this is not quite the topic of this one, but I would uh, like, like to quickly answer it. It's, are you anonymizing the data to avoid that the source can be re-identified? Yes, we are pseudonymizing the data. The hospitals do that. We have a whole uh, project uh, developing guidelines for how to best de-identify data. This can also be found on our website. Uh, coming back to the um, webinar related, more webinar content related questions. Uh, do you have technical templates, software packages for easy transforming, for example, C uh, CSV files to RDF? Um, we are working on these things. Um, however, what you need to say is, for example, CSV normally are pretty flat. The RDF has much more possibility to interconnect. So normally if you only transform form a flat thing into RDF, then yes, you need to maybe do additional connections or actually the, the additional value comes when you do additional connections. So I think, again, it's not an easy transformation between the standards because they really have different um, ideas behind it. I think, Vasundra, you unmute yourself yes, and maybe you want I mean, to add to we it. We have our internal tools as well, um, where we do those transformation with those external terminologies that we mentioned, which are basically provided as Excel files or CSV files. So we have scripts to transform them into RDF. So they're quite fit for purposes, but there are also existing tools or languages that allows you to do mapping from CSV or relational database content into RDF. So this is called the R2 RML. And this is also something that we are using to be able to generate mock data, for example. So we are working on those things. Thank you, Vasundra. Then we have a question. The SNOMED CT mapping, uh, so the coding of the data, at the end, it must be done somewhere in the data pipeline, right? So what is the answer? How to do this mapping, uh, respective the coding exercise in a semi-automated way? Are there any software solutions out there or it is done manually? So this is probably a question that more relates to the work that is being done at the uh, university hospitals. But maybe Sabine, do you want to have a short answer to this as well? Exactly. <laughs> Try to keep it short. Again, I think we need to see the two different uses of SNOMED CT. I think one comes in with the meaning binding. And here, of course, we by mapping to our SPHN schema, you get the mapping to um, the SNOMED CT as well. And as more as we extend our um, core template with more ontologies, somehow you get it with, with one mapping. So I think on, on that one, actually, we are providing the kind of process how to get that in. When we now talk about coding data in the hospitals, for example, with the heart rate example, this resting state or, or 
um, things. This is really um, now done within the hospitals. Also here, they have to map from their local standards to the coding system. And since there is no, it's not the same, you know, it's not done in a standardized way. So there's, um, it's really hard to get um, um, here also a an, an unique um, tool which um, can do it for everyone. Of course, there is more and more the, the software companies providing um, clinical information systems, they are more and more aware that this is of high value. So there is already um, companies which are actually in the back end having, for example, SNOMED CT annotated fields. So for example, if there is the question for the heart rate in the back end, actually the software has already the SNOMED CT um, code annotated. However, that's um, a development which is coming is still very rare. And I think that's really what we will hope to see in the the coming years that actually this is really the importance is raised because I think what we always hear is the hospitals need to say that this is a requirement for the software companies to develop that. So I think that's maybe also here a, a statement, please, if you look for new software, think about these things as well. Thank you, Sabine. And the last question um, is about um, access control. And maybe we have to bring now Biomed IT into the loop quickly. How are access control and consent handled? So Sparkle and RDF do not provide very easy ways of enforcing access control. How is this envisioned in the context of the project? Exactly. So I think that goes in all of the idea of Biomed IT. So currently at the moment, we are only pulling data together for specific projects. So uh, the consent question is handled on the hospital side. So currently um, the hospitals will only send data to a project which has the appropriated consent and um, not otherwise. And also within Biomed IT, each project has their isolated project space where they get their data. Also, they, everyone gets a known instance of GraphDB, for example. So we are not doing one big triple store where we do different user accounts to different data. So it's really data goes for one project, um, has their isolated project space. They can analyze it. Um, and um, this is the kind of concept which we adapted with Biomed IT, which um, yeah, as you said, it's completely independent from RDF and SparkQL. Very good. Thank you very much uh, to all of you uh, once more. Also to uh, all of you who attended uh, this webinar. As we said, it's going to be online on YouTube. And of course, please do not hesitate to forward us via email any additional questions. Also feedback on our interoperability framework. We are happy to receive your feedback. We are happy to uh, discuss with you further. Thank you very much for your attendance. Have a good day. Bye.